All right, everyone, welcome back. And for those of you with new faces, welcome. Uh, again, my name is Ron Rivers. We're going to be discussing self-actualization in the age of crisis today. And this is our final course of the four that we've done. Um, and if you're not on our email list and you're of interest, let me know because I can make sure I, I, by the end of the day today, I'll send out all of the courses we've done, all of the videos, um, the chapter references, etc. Today's our final discussion about systemic actualization. So we're just going to do a brief recap of what we've discussed so far. In our first course, we reviewed what we call the age of crisis, often referred to as the polycrisis or the metacrisis. The basic idea that uh, we have a, a, a wide variety of crises surrounding us, any one of which would be bad enough, but collectively they form an existential threat to the way of, of human life. Uh, we discuss the time and the divinity of the moment, and this that kind of grounds our spiritual project. So self-actualization in the age of crisis is about embracing uh, new frameworks of meaning and value. I argue that they are at the center of our various challenges is the frameworks of meaning and value we've inherited. And we do that through aligning with uh, the, the information that cosmology and physics tells us is, is real, tells us our observations of the universe. Specifically, we argue um, that the universe is in fact infinite, the material nature of reality is an infinite ever-present now, past is always unknown, uh, excuse me, inaccessible, future is always unknown. We recognize that there is, in fact, a single truth that is change. It is the universal commonality. It is the material nature of reality. It is ever-present transformation. And from there, we identify two observable infinities, uh, the universe itself and human imagination. And we say, through the alignment of those two, divinity is achieved within the moment. We also redefine the self. We say, in a relational universe governed by the single truth, the self is more accurately defined as the relationship between individual and their circumstances within a given moment. Because our capacity to act, our capacity to imagine, is always in relation to the circumstances we find ourselves in. Therefore, we break down self-actualization into the concept of individual actualization, right? the development of I, that's what we talked about last week, and systemic actualization, the development of we, that's what we'll talk about this week. Um, just as a quick note from last week's conversation, we discussed the science of individual actualization, so a lot of Maslow and his works. Uh, we discussed the rooting of, of being in the idea of the concepts of cooperation and competition, primarily addressing the fact that progress today in the systems that we embody and we are surrounded by um, prioritize self-assertion and competition as the, the primary means of advancement. And the question is, how do we reframe that to cooperation and coordination to kind of better unleash the kind of latent potential that exists you know, trapped within these systems of our own making? We discussed being an authentic imposter, the idea that much of the world happens to us and how do we kind of overcome and feel, feel confident in our place in space when so much of the universe is out of our control. We explored core values, the core values that were most easily remembered as the acronym Reframe Courage. Uh, and these are core values that help to align us uh, with the infinite nature of reality, bring our, our, our presence to the immediate present and encourage us to act. Those core values were relation, uh, equity, flexibility, restraint, uh, awareness, minimalism, and enthusiasm, and then courage. Uh, and then from there, we talked about uh, the process of soul craft, routine, discipline, and mastery. How do we actually apply these core values uh, to our daily lives? How do we develop habits and, and frameworks for orienting ourselves to the world so that through our embodiment of those core values, we project them into the world? And then finally, we talked about small and high rituals, uh, things that we have practiced that we embody, whether um, personally or collectively to kind of bring us closer to the values we seek to embody, further our alignment, and ground ourselves in that community. So today we're going to talk about systemic actualization. And systemic actualization represents really the manifestation of our, our spiritual project. The, the central thesis of the book is that we have to bind spiritual renaissance to systemic reformation. That if, we're, if our spirituality, if our orientation with the world is not bound to a systemic project, that it doesn't necessarily represent the divinity inherent at all. And part of aligning ourselves with the relational universe governed by the single truth is that recognition that each of us have an aspect of that infinity within us, right? We possess an aspect of that imagination, and through the alignment of the imagination in the moment, we are become more godlike, we create, we bring the new into the universe. Um, so that is the greatest expression of our powers, and that is what we seek to do for the, the vast majority of people, how do we get more people to do that? So, Systemic actualization represents, again, a very deep-seated component of the revised spiritual project of the non-religion religion. That is to elevate the collective condition, 
through suites of public works, so to allow more people to express their imagination in more moments, to allow more people to have the power to do that, um, as opposed to the present system, which I would argue that um, only a, a, a select percentage of people in the, in the world today are actually able to, to most fully utilize their powers within the moment. Now, ours is, you know, when we think about systemic actualization and the ideal, we recognize that the ideal of systemic actualization is that we create a world where individuals are free to redirect themselves, redirect the course of their life, redirect the course of their actions, their beliefs, without permission from the groups that they're surrounded by or the systems they're surrounded by, right? That's the idea is we want to, throughout the course, we've spoken a lot about furthering and encouraging our experimentalist impulse. In a world of AI, in a world of self-learning machines, anything that can be repeated can be written into code, software can do. And this is where we're headed. So it leaves human beings open for our greatest power, which is imagination. It's the creation of the new, right? Coordination. And, but today, there's a gap, right? We know that's coming, but we lack the infrastructure, systemically, to support that for the greatest amount of people possible. So that's our conversation today, is how do we orient that? This chapter of the book is pretty deep. So there's no, I can't cover it all. My initial notes for this was like three hours. So I had to cut it kind of down and we're gonna kind of take a high level approach to, uh, to, to how we view this. So what I wanna express and what we're really gonna cover is an orientation. So while the book covers a lot of what I would say blueprints, it has like distinct plans of how we might interact this, today's gonna to be much more about how do we think about systems in a relational universe governed by the single truth, where our ideal is maximizing collective elevation, right? So to free that latent imagination trapped within systems for our own making. We're gonna do that. Uh, we're gonna come cover uh, five or four distinct topics. The first is self-changing systems. So that's gonna be kind of our previous concept. How do we develop uh, institutions that support their own revision, as opposed to resisting it, which is the, this, what it happens today is most of the things that we're surrounded by when I say systems, I mean uh, law, economics, uh, politics, spirituality, religion. Um, th most of these institutions resist their own revision. They attempt to reinforce the past onto the present. Uh, and we reject that. We say that's not enough. We'll talk about economy, labor, and property. And that's going to be a pretty in-depth discussion. I'm going to break that topic down into several subcategories, including um, uh, finance and the real economy, taxation, free labor, uh, and more. We'll talk about the eight dignities. The eight dignities are, is our spiritual systemic project. So it's, the argument I make in the book is that the eight dignities will free the collective to kind of exercise their imagination in their own direction. Um, it is not, for example, a guarantee of luxury. It's not a guarantee of success. But what it is, a guarantee of, of access to opportunity, right? Equity in the way we distribute the advantage and, and opportunity in that case. And then we'll briefly kind of wrap it up with Spirit Doubt, just the community that's actually formed around the book that exists today, and we'll talk a bit about that. So let's dive in. Self-changing systems is the idea that, as I mentioned just a moment ago, today the dominant economic, legal, political, spiritual, social institutions resist their own revision by design. They are intended to preserve the status quo. And in the United States, the United States for example, all of the systems that we presently inhabit, our law, our economics, our politics, are essentially minor evolutions of the US Constitution, right? They've all, we've kind of evolved from this original set of laws. The challenge being, the US Constitution was an inherently exclusive document. That is to say that only a certain amount of people, or a group of people, right, specifically white property-owning males, were able to participate in the governing of society. Uh, if, you, if you weren't in that category, you didn't have a say. You didn't have rights to vote or direct society. Uh, so while we've made progress over time, it's important to note that that progress was not part of the system. It came from social unrest, right? Women's suffrage, uh, the you know, equitable treatment of people of color. These were not things that the government gave us. These are things that the collective populace organized around to demand, right? Because if the systems were left to their own devices, they would not have given that privilege or that, I should say, that right to, to the groups of, of, at the time, minority groups. So in, in, you know, in align with our, our, our core values of relation, equity, and flexibility, we want to design systems and institutions that support their own revision, that constantly embrace challenge and change as opposed to resisting it. So how do we do that? 
Well, there's a number of ways we're going to kind of dive into, but I'm going to kind of give you one kind of visual of what we call an organization that is either a sociocracy or a holacracy. Um, a holacracy essentially means like circles within circles. So what this means and what this refers to is um, you can imagine this large blue circle as the entire organization. So this is actually Spirit Dow's you know, a map. So this is the entire organization uh, and, and how it works. Now typically when we think of a corporation or any organization, it's a very hierarchical design. So what I mean by that is there's a CEO and a leadership team and it, if you've ever worked in a, a C corp before, they primarily dictate everything, right? And, and although they take feedback and goes up, they are the kind of end decision makers. So the vast majority of participants within that ecosystem don't necessarily have a strong say in, in how the organization is directed. This type of work, this kind of we call it pod work or grouping, right? What it does is it maximizes the freedom of people to work how they want to work. So what do I mean by that? Each of these different circles, this one's kind of light, it's like a blue, a purple, a yellow, a green. Each of these represents a different group. And in holacracy or sociocracy organizations, each of these different groups can have different structures for organizing themselves. So what do I mean? The executive pod, think about it as like a traditional senior leadership team up here, this purple one. That could be what we call like a high council system of governance. So they might have just a majority vote. They're voted into that position, they distribute finances, and in order for bills to pass or movements to pass, it must be like a, let's say, a five out of nine or a three out of five vote, right? It must be a majority of vote. Now, if we go down here to the dev pod, these individuals might choose to, to, to organize themselves as a direct democracy with merit. So what do I mean by that? Everyone gets a vote, there is no, you know, uh, there's no senior vote, but, but votes happen and vote power is increased by your contribution. So if you're working in this organization and you're contributing more, your vote has more weight. So you might have like a, your vote might be worth two or three votes depending on how senior you are in that organization. We could also imagine, um, let's say a, a, a pod where maybe there's a, the organization owns property. I own a building. For that pod, we may want to organize it as a traditional hierarchy. That is to say there's a CEO and he or she is the boss and they command and what they say goes. The emphasis that I want to give you in here is that what we want to do is create organizations that can allow different structures of operation, different structures of coordination within the same organization, as opposed to making everyone fit into a single specific structure. Right? One of the challenges with our inheritance of these institutions is that they, they make us take a very specific shape. They make us take a very specific shape of how we have to work. Now, systemic actualization represents a paradigm where, if we were to ask the question, right, who, who can succeed in, in the organizations today, the answer is a very specific kind of person. Systemic actualization changes that answer. It says that an increasing variety of people can kind of see because they're empowered to work the way they want to work. Now, how do you deal with conflict in an organization like this, where you, know, you have this greater empowerment of the individuals? Well, that's the beauty of it. If you put, there's, there's technologies today, for example, like blockchain, which is a, a digital ledger technology, a ledger being like an accounting book, right? It just accounts for transactions. But if you organize people like this, there's the capacity to do what we call fork. So let's say, for example, the dev pod, uh, at the beginning of the, the, the year, maybe the dev pod gets uh, $100,000 to work with. They say, okay, this is your budget for the year. You're gonna employ these people. This is what you're gonna do. But within this group, there's a split. Three people want to say, we absolutely have to do you know, path A, and, and the other three say, we absolutely have to do path B. Well, in a traditional organization, what would happen is a decision would be made, and then the parties would have to kind of collaborate, and, and half the people in that group would be working on something that they're not really excited about. With this type of organization design, what you can do is you can, they can fork, which means they can essentially split. So that group can split into two different pods, split the money down the middle, and essentially each pod can work on what they believe is the ideal towards the shared objectives of the organization. And what's beautiful about that is it allows real-time experimentalism, real-time testing. So one of those pathways will prove more fruitful than the other, and then the collectively the community can decide what they decide to fund, do they keep both, do they not? So this kind of increases, this kind of organization helps to further that experimentalist impulse that we've talked about, that we want to design. So eventually they're gonna come up with one but they're going to be free to reach a... To find consensus, to find right, exactly. Okay. So I think, to your point, yes, the, the goal is to find the ideal, 
But what this does is allow for greater experimentation of how do we play and find that ideal as opposed to someone at the top saying, no, this is the way we go, do it this way. And then you, half your team is disgruntled. They, they're not really excited to work on this project. So this is, again, it, it helps to further this kind of experimentalist impulse and, and allow organizations to be subject to change without like, collapsing upon themselves because they're designed from the start to be decentralized, to allow this kind of grouping um, and the way they, they work together. So from here, th this is, I'm going to talk more about this um, towards the end of the conversation today, but this is really a structure that is, uh, this is Spirit Dow's actual structure, and it's, it's often referred to, if you've heard the term DAO, um, it, it stands for D-A-O, it's Decentralized Autonomous Organization. These are organizations that are all digital, they run online, so people from around the world work on it. Uh, we have members of Spirit Dow in Canada, we have members in New York, in Philly, in California, um, so they're all over, but we all coordinate. And because we leverage digital technology to do this, um, it allows us to coordinate in ways that are high trust but low effort, right? So we can encode things, there's things called smart contracts, um, and I'll, I'll just give a surface level overview. Smart contracts allows us to program rules and laws into agreements, and then those agreements automatically execute, right? So you don't have to ask to be paid. If you do the objective, the, the funds are automatically deposited into your account. Um, and we'll dive more into why these are important in, in, as we get more into the, the conversation. But now we're going to dive into kind of the, the large meat of our talk today, which is economy, labor, and property. So the idea behind economy, labor, and property is very similar to what we mentioned before, is who fits into society today? Who can succeed to the greatest degree possible? And today that answer is a very specific kind of person. Our objective is to make that an ever-increasing variety of people. And when we think about economy, labor, and property, these are the, the rules governing society that define who's an insider and who is an outsider. Who reaps the most benefits from the, the organization of society and who, who is essentially subject to the whims of those reaping the benefits. So when we think about defining and, and really kind of transforming economy, labor, and property, we have to recognize, well, actually, before I get into that, let's just start with a brief definition, right? Economies are systems of transactions that repeat themselves, right? So that's what an economy is. Any, any transaction between two individuals or more that repeats itself over time, a market refers to a specific vertical of transactions. So I could say an agricultural market, right? That, that you know, food markets. I could say a labor market, right? The, the people moving. And then when we say the economy, it essentially refers to all of the transactions occurring either within a specific vertical or all total verticals. Now, why this matters is we inhabit arrangements today. The law surrounding economy, labor, and property today, again, reinforce a specific single way of doing things. Uh, and it's really kind of you know, drilled down to a capitalist kind of uh, method of, of operation, of transaction being our highest form of cooperation. Um, and it's very difficult to kind of transcend the crisis because very much those institutions are, in many ways, the reasons we find ourselves where we are. So to that note, we have to recognize too, when we think about like the idea of economy and, and for example, our present institutions, most people are not capitalists. I think that's like an often you know, misconception. All of us participate in the capitalist system, but being capitalist by definition is when your money works for you. I have excess capital, I can invest it, I, don't, I can kind of oversee it, but uh, working a job does not make you a capitalist, right? Being an entrepreneur, but you're living you know, on those paychecks does not make you a capitalist. Um, it makes you commoditize labor. And the, uh, again, and, and for those of you guys who are, who are new to the class, my argument is not to substitute one ism for another. It's not to throw out capitalism and, let's say, for example, put in socialism. That, that would create an equal amount of problems just in a different direction. Um, in aligning with the relational universe governed by the single truth, we don't want to prohibit any way of life so long as it you know, respects the divinity and the dignity of the other. Now, when we recognize is that Today, the law surrounding economy, labor, and property proliferate disadvantage by design. It goes back to that initial point I made about the Constitution. When your founding document is inherently exclusive and it only respects the rights of a certain group of people, all the kind of evolutions of that document are going to kind of further that same ethos uh, over time. So we have ample examples in our history, we won't go into them today, uh, but they are in the book, of how groups have been discriminated leveraging the laws 
that we surround ourselves with. So the idea is, you know, to respect the divinity of the other, we have to reimagine how we, we think about our laws and grouping that way. Now, so I want to go, we'll kind of move into finance and the, the real economy. So the question that this bounds is like when we think about finance and capital as a means of you know, integrating systemic actualization, reimagining society, we have to begin with a question, right? How do we get finance to serve the productive agenda of society as opposed to serving itself? So when I mean the real economy, when I say the real economy, what does that mean? The real economy refers to any work that solves problems for people, right? So uh, products, services, things that help people accomplish their goals. So most things fit into the real economy. But here's what doesn't fit into the real economy. High frequency algorithmic trading, which hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars of our capital is tied up into. It's the high, you know, the high, uh, the, the mega finance firms, right? The mega conglomerates, where essentially you have billions of dollars tied up into productive work that has no outcome outside of making the number on a spreadsheet go up, right? And the problem with high finance, as you probably remember, let's say from 2008 is a great example, but I believe we're, gonna, we're already in the process of having another crisis in that, that, that extent. We have regional banks collapsing right now, um, is that the financiers, right, through the crisis of elected misrepresentation, they bribe the politicians, they remove restrictions, and what happens is they make, they, they do these extremely risky things, and they make a ton of money. But when the house of cards collapses, they socialize their losses. The government bails out the banks. No one goes to jail, right? Maybe one person does, some sort of figurehead. But ultimately, they make hundreds of millions of dollars doing nothing but just playing the numbers on a spreadsheet. But the moment that crashes and people lose their retirement accounts or their bank fails, those losses, the government is forced to bail them out. So, in binding finance to the real economy, we have to undertake a, a, a view of capital that capital for capital's sake, right? Just increasing money for money's sake is not an ideal focus of our energy. And more importantly, it's in no way, shape, or form free from alteration or limitation. It, it is not healthy for society to have a class of people that are able to gamble so freely and then again, again perpetually socialize their losses. And because they're, they're so integrated with our political system, right? Goldman Sachs like literally sponsors the, uh, the congressional envoy. When you have new members of the House, it's sponsored by Goldman Sachs, sponsored by a financial system. So they're so integrated with our politics that they're almost immune from their failure. So they're willing to take these risks because they know, you know no one's gonna go to jail. They're just gonna get bailed out. When, when, and I say when very specifically because it's always the same pattern. What they do is they, they allow these algorithms to kind of go wild, they get progressively more risky, and then eventually they know, well, this is going to collapse, and, and then here we are. And I think we're kind of really on the cusp of one of those in the immediate present. Now, when we think about how do we diminish the inequities created by the system, well, today, the primary way that like governments around the world, or, let's say the US, for example, handles, so how do we, all okay, right, so this system obviously creates disadvantage, but how do we address that? Well, most of the solutions today are, are retroactive. And what I mean by that is, let's say you have a you or your, your people, an individual is harmed by this kind of high financier, the bank crashes, they lose their money, maybe their mortgage you know, defaults, maybe there's a bunch of chaos it ensues because of that. What the government does is they say, okay, well, we're sorry that happened to you. Here's some money, you know, let, let's, let's call it even, we'll say it's good. But what they never do is they never address the root cause. They don't go back and say, hey, this system, this high finance system is a threat to the collective well-being of America's middle and lower classes, even in some extent of the, the higher classes. Um, and the, the challenge, again, with this system as it is, is that it reinforces these systems of class and caste, where by kind of having these high finance systems and having these individuals who are able to speculate to such an unfettered degree, their wealth compounds enormously compared to the average individual. They'll make $100 million a year where, what's the average American can make? $45,000, $50,000 a year? Um, so when we think about the nature of equity in, in the relation to these systems, we have to reconceptualize finance as an instrument to primarily serve the productive agenda of society, bind it through laws, through restrictions, to only focus on productive efforts, 
not this you know, high frequency speculation. Now, one caveat. I do want to emphasize, I don't think all speculation is bad. It's not that we should ban private investment, right? I think private investment is really a great tool, especially for people who are going against the grain, who want to challenge the status quo, and, or they're going to do something that's not popular. That's where private investment is really valuable, because someone can say, yes, I'm going to bet on you. Go. Go forth and change. Go forth and create your vision. So it's not, again, it's not about the wholesale banning of one thing, but it's to say that there's an aspect of our economy today that is proven to be harmful, that adds no value to the productive agenda of society, it doesn't contribute anything. Again, it's all about making numbers on a spreadsheet go up. And it carries immense risk for the collective population. It's an unhealthy organization of society. So when we think about our economy, we have to reorient ourselves around what we think is and is not acceptable in terms of finance. Now, in this, there's kind of two additional kind of opposing points I'll make about this. Um, when we think about our economic arrangements, we have to think about it as well. In the dogmatic approach we presently have to capitalism, there's aspects of it that are very unhealthy that are features and not bugs. So what do I mean by that? In our present capitalist system, unemployment is a feature of capitalism as it's governed today. And that's necessary, like unemployment is necessary because it keeps labor costs down, right? If you have full employment, the price of hiring someone goes up pretty dramatically. And so what they do, and the government works to keep certain people out of work. And again, this furthers a class and caste system. If you're out of work, if you're not bringing in capital, you're perpetually losing capital. So your net worth goes down. There are alternatives. Um, and I discussed this in the book. There's a great book by Stephanie, uh, Professor Stephanie Keaton. It's called about uh, modern monetary theory. The idea being that there are alternatives. So for example, you can imagine a full employment economy where instead of having people unemployed, you have a public sector work. Right? And I, I de we're not going to talk about it today, but I detail what this might look like in a chapter called Civic Cores. Uh, but a public sector work where when the private sector is doing more, uh, poorly, more people enter the public sector work. And they, you know, we have a ton of infrastructure projects, for example, in the United States that could use a ton of uh, help. There's a lot of different ways we could do. And then when the private sector becomes more incentivizing, people then leave and go to the private sector. But the idea is there's never no employment. There's always a direction for them to focus their energy, and more importantly, there's always the training necessary to kind of help them redirect their lives in that new direction. So as opposed to confining people to the margins by design, as opposed to saying, well, some of you are going to be unemployed, tough luck, figure it out, here's you know, a third of what you were making, I hope it can afford your rent and food. We say, no, there are opportunities in, in every direction, and we recognize that, again, this is all a policy choice. Unemployment is very much a policy choice. It is a, a, a package of laws and economic beliefs that we, we cling to, uh, that despite the kind of the, the chaos it, it, it could create. So there are alternatives that I discuss in the book. Now, let's talk about everyone's favorite subject, taxation. So taxation is, in a systemically actualized society, taxation is important because taxation funds the public goods necessary to elevate the collective condition. So the United States, you, you may have heard, is is the, we have what we consider the most progressive system of taxation. That means it, it grows as you make more, you get taxed more. But here's a fun fact. Compared to our European counterparts, we actually take in about 10% less taxes in relation to GDP than they do. So we take in less. Now, I would make the argument that what matters most about taxation is the total money is taken in. That's what matters, because that's what's supposed to fund public goods and, and public services. So the Europeans use a VAT tax, a value-added tax. That's a consumption tax. So it taxes your transition, uh, transactions as opposed to your, your income. Um, so the Europeans do several things. First and foremost, they, they tax, their taxes actually fund their programs. I think in the United States, there's, there's some confusion about what taxation is. At the municipal and state level, it is accurate to say that when you pay your municipal taxes, they support your public infrastructure. So for example, when I was writing the book, I interviewed about 10 different um, mayors and councils in the state of New Jersey. In New Jersey, about 60 to 70% on average of property taxes fund the local schools, the high schools, the elementary schools. Same thing is true with the state. Your state taxes fund programs. Federal taxes do not fund programs. At the federal level, your taxes serve one purpose, and that's to reduce the total money supply. So it's a way they keep the currency in check. When we do federal programs, like a federal aid program, those are always voted upon um, by Congress, and then the money is created. In the United States, and in every Western democracy, um, 
credit is created at the point of contract. Right? So it's a, we often confuse, like we think there's a money supply. That's not the case. When I go to a bank and I say, I'm gonna get a mortgage, I need $200,000, and they give me that mortgage. The moment I put ink to paper, that $200,000 is created, it is new, it's added to the total money supply. So there's no balance in the money. Money is literally managed by banks, and banks are private enterprises, right? So our collective economic system is in the hands of private institutions that intend to extract from it. So but if I take a mortgage, the bank is assuming I'm going to back up to $2,000, maybe over 15 years. But, but so it, it, in a sense, you're right, it's created, but they see it as income. Oh, sure. And as they're, as they're getting it, they invest it to make money on my money. Right? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Everything you said is correct. But I want to emphasize that, like in terms of money supply, it's just created after there. Like that's how fiat money is created. Um, there's no backing, right? You may remember um, probably before of your time, but we went, you know, from the gold standard to a fiat standard under Woodrow Wilson, and the idea that um, there's nothing backing our capital besides the government, right? The government is backing it. Um, but as you know, like, and when we think about it, that's actually a great segue. When we think about um, finance and the real economy today, like there's two core measures, right? It's productivity and debt. So GDP and debt is how we manage the health of an economy. But these numbers are highly manipulated, right? Like debt is obviously manipulated and it's, it's at this point, the US prints its own money so we can never run out of money. Um, it, so as long as it's a, a global reserve currency, which in the present state of, of calamity and war, we're seeing that you know, people are opting out, right? There's BRICS, uh, the, which is like Africa, uh, China and Russia. Um, which are kind of forming their own kind of base currency. So we're seeing like the US hegemony on, on capital kind of being said, but the point, I, you know, I'm gonna kind of get back to taxation for a moment. A reimagining of taxation is vital to systemic actualization because we have to, again, increase the tax rate to, to kind of fund these public goods to support collective elevation. If we're serious about freeing the latent imagination trapped by the system we've created, we need to fund those systems. Now in the book, um, I argue for kind of two distinct taxation methods. The first is Henry George's land value tax. Henry George was an extremely popular author in like the late 1800s, early 1900s. His book was the second best-selling book under the Bible uh, when he was alive. And really fascinating concept, what he, uh, he argues is that land is like the ultimate commodity. It's the only thing that we can't make more of. So you have to really tax land at a very high level. And what that does is it solves one of our major problems today, which is there's a ton of land held by speculative corporations. So it's the same thing you're seeing in the housing market today, right? The housing market, for, for example, for I'm a millennial, I'm almost, I'll be 40 in May, and my generation, including myself, struggles to own a house, right? The, the prices for a starter house are half a million dollars. Um, it's pretty astronomical, and, but there's mega firms that own hundreds, if not thousands of houses that they're just sitting on, right? And they're kind of like rent seeking on those houses. So land value tax, would, would decimate that strategy. Because if you own all that land, you're paying a very high premium. As opposed to today, you pay premiums on what's built on the land. So is it a house, is it a corporate building, right? So it shifts that. But my ideal taxation that I think is ideal for a systemically actualized society is Nicholas Caldor's taxation model. It's very simple. There's, it, what it does is it taxes the difference between income and savings and investment. So it's a consumption tax. The beauty of this model is that you can adjust the percentage of tax. So what do I mean by that? Well, first and foremost, before I get into the, the percentage, anything not counted as spent, uh, saved or invested is counted as spent. So right away, it eliminates a lot of the loopholes that we have today, right? There's a lot of corruption today because you can hide your money in a lot of different directions. This is very simple. If you can't show that it's invested, we're counting it as spent. And what they do is they say, we can change the variable percentage on how we tax your consumption. Now, why is consumption tax ideal? Because when you have, in our, in our first lecture, of the, and we discussed, the, we discussed the age of crisis and the billionaire God King, we did the math around spending a billion dollars. And in short, and just as a reminder, if you have one billion dollars, you'd have to spend $1,000 every hour for 24 hours a day for 114 years to spend that first billion. Not including all the interest you accrue from having it sit in the back, right? So it's, um, it's impossible to like tax a billionaire on pure consumption, or for example, sometimes you hear like a flat tax, everyone should pay the same route, the same rate. Reject that in its entirety, that just solidifies interest to interest. So what this does is we have variable percentages. So we can imagine that 
the bottom 20% of people would pay 0% consumption tax. If you're making $40,000 or less, you pay no tax on your consumption. And you progressively step it up. But where it matters is, let's say someone who, who made $800 million and they have $3 billion in savings. There's no limit on what you can tax them on their consumption. So we could say for every dollar you spend, you're taxed $5. Because the individual, to some extent, cannot escape consumption. Right? So what it is is a way of taxation that redistributes advantage uh, that avoids, for example, what we all want to avoid, which is like a violent kind of revolution, a violent kind of coming, but also creates a more equitable system to fund the public infrastructure necessary to systemically actualize. So Nicholas Calder's tax allows that. Move on. Then move on to free labor. So when we talk about free labor, the idea behind free labor is pretty straightforward. It's where an individual's security and dignity are unbound to employment. And I want to emphasize free labor, although today it might seem like a foreign concept, was never intended to be as permanent as it is today. Lincoln spoke about this, actually. He talked about wage labor um, as a transition into free labor. It was never intended to be permanent. Wage labor is akin to slavery. Okay, in that uh, it, it kind of perpetually bound you. When I say security, like, let me give you a very distinct example. In the United States, our health care is bound to employment. You are not secure unless you are working. I shared earlier in one of the other classes, three weeks I, I've been in a, a philanthropy and, and nonprofit software company for three years, one of the founding members. Uh, we had, um, recently, not recently, about a year ago, the investors got involved, new CEO, and they closed my division. So now my family, including my three and a half year old, don't have health care. I have to pay for that out of pocket. And it's not cheap. If anybody doesn't pay for your government health care directly, um, it's very expensive. So my security is permanently bound. If I don't have a job with health care, my family is at permanent risk, right? Uh, in that like, I have to pay out of pocket for this uh, you know, very exorbitant health care. And when we think about free labor, it's, a, it's an organization of labor where people are free to kind of direct their creativity and creative interests in the directions of their choosing. So they're working on things that they're passionate about. And what's vital to that is we can imagine free labor in a society where employment becomes less of this long-term, I mean, I think the idea of like a career anymore is not realistic. I think many of you probably you came up in a world where you were able to kind of work in a single direction for X amount of years and make a long-term career. Um, most people in my generation don't feel that way. Most people, we understand that like you're going to be there for three to five years and they're going to fire you or you're going to have to find something else because it stagnates. Um, so the, the idea of a secure career is no longer a viable thing. But the alternative is in a systemically actualized society where you know, your security and dignity are not bound to employment, Work then becomes this like kind of perpetual engagement with either small or long-term projects in the at the discretion of the individual working. So we, we kind of encourage this kind of gig economy idea, but because your vital security is not bound to it, you're kind of free to work on the things that you want to work on that excite you, that you're passionate about. Um, ideally, again, encouraging individuals to align the observable and fit in the moment. That's always our when we return to systemic actual actualization, it's about how do we maximize capacity of the individual to direct the flow of their time experience in alignment with their vision of the good. Now this is based on an education system that can support this, and we'll dive more into education in a bit, but also you know, both for um, youth and uh, adult education as a, a continuing process. But a, a large part of this is about reinforcing our core values, a core value of relation, a core value of equity, our core value of enthusiasm. Right? When we think about systemic actualization, it's very much a manifestation of the core values we embody into the world and into the creations we surround ourselves with. Again, I want to highlight, the larger struggle of the crisis is that we've infused specific frameworks of meaning and value into the systems we surround ourselves with. And the problem is, they fail to meet the needs of the moment. It's not that they were bad forever, it's not that they've only done bad or good things, that's irrelevant. It's that today we need a different orientation to overcome the various struggles that we're, we're facing, um, and they are just not enough. So that's the intent. Now, when we think about, let's like talk briefly about, I mentioned wage labor akin to slavery. We can also talk about like entrepreneurship, right? So today, in many cases, the entrepreneur is worse off than wage labor. The, the rules and laws surrounding entrepreneurship are very much in favor of property-owning uh, entrepreneurs. 
So when you're talking about like 90, something about like, uh, I think most businesses in the United States are small businesses, I think it's over 95%, but most of them are not property owning small businesses, right? It's like the mom and pop shop or the deli or the, you know, the, the small thing. They're renting that place, right? And in most cases, they are living paycheck to paycheck or they're paying for their family. It's not like they're accumulating mass wealth with their small business. So when we think about organizing the laws surrounding entrepreneurship, we recognize that if we, if we want to embrace the dogma of American exceptionalism, right, which is a propaganda we've all been exposed to for most of our lives, we have to recognize that today it's only ever intended to apply to a small group of people, those who own the property, those are property owning engineers. The rest of everyone else is fairly worse off. Then there's also like gig economy workers. A gig economy is um, Uber or um, DoorDash, you know, where you work for a company. And the problem with those jobs is you assume all of the risks of entrepreneurship, but you get none of the benefits. You have no equity, you have no security, right? You're, you're taking on all this risk, but none of that. So we have to, when we think about free labor, it's a, again, it's about breaking free of the confines of a single legal order of work, a single legal order of economics that restrains how we can experiment and kind of create and, and further our experimentalist impulse and ultimately to work. So free labor is certainly the ideal. Ultimately, and I'm going to move on to the next topic in a moment, but ultimately free labor is a way to deepen the alignment between individuals and their everyday life with their relational universe governed by the student truth. It allows them to direct the flow of their time experience in a way that aligns with their values, and more importantly, allows them to align those observable things so they're doing something that excites them, that creates, that helps create the new and solves problems in that direction. So we're gonna talk about property. Now, Property is, I want to start with like what this, this conversation is not about in property. It's not about the abolition of private property. I think having something that we all want and, and is uniquely ours is both important and a very natural aspect of being human, right? Uh, now, we recognize that property in its present state is very much an evolution of our agricultural transformation, right? And we know that for, so, anatomically modeled human beings, people who look like us, like a baby who was born would be identical to us, have been around for approximately 200,000 years. So we've been agricultural for about 12,000 of those years. Um, so for the vast majority of human history in our time, time span, property wasn't a thing. Um, it, it's, you didn't hand down anything in a, in a tribal society because you're always moving, right? So the whole orientation of property and family was very different. It was much more of a collective orientation. Property came to be with the aggregation, uh, the invention of agriculture and surpluses, and this set the foundation for what we would call dynastic wealth. The idea that your wealth is primarily based on who your parents are, and not as opposed to societal wealth, right? Our project of systemic actualization is transforming the world to reinforce societal wealth. The idea that you're born at the most advanced time ever today. And because of that, you have a right to the collective resources that we've developed over time, of all of human progress to this moment. Now, we want to recognize that today, when we think about property, all property kind of comes down to, uh, at least the legal frameworks are, again, evolutions of the U.S. Constitution. The U.S. Constitution is a document that predicated property as the cornerstone of a free society, right? Private property is the foundational cornerstone of a free society. That's what the U.S. Constitution really was about. That was the entire kind of revolution. Was it was not allowing, for example, the monarch to have access and taxation to things that are yours. And but the document itself is very ambiguous about what private property is. It doesn't define it, and that's purposeful, right? Um, and that's actually a great foresight. But as I mentioned earlier, what it's not ambiguous about is who was able to own private property. Again, it was an exclusive document. It was a legal document that, that prioritized one class of people at the expense of the rest. And if you weren't part of that group, tough luck, you weren't able to participate. Right? So our reimagination of, of property is a recognition that while private property is good, it is not free from alteration or limitation. Today, because of a light of conditioning of, of propaganda through a crisis of information, truth, and trust, 
through the, the, the price of elected misrepresentation, that the fact that like our lawmakers are in the pockets of corporations. We have a very dogmatic approach to private property. We have a very dogmatic approach to what is acceptable. And the idea is it's unfettered. You know, if you can get it, get it. And it's a very, again, it's a, it's a, it's a form of transaction and progress that prioritizes self-assertion to the world. This is mine, I'm gonna take it, and that's the ideal. But that is in many ways the same philosophies that brought these crises to our doorstep. So in envisioning an alternative, we have to be bold enough to say, you know what, that is not ideal for collective benefit. It's not the restriction of all private property, absolutely not. But it is in fact the development of alternative forms of property and contract. Okay, so it's about not having Instead of only having one form of property and contract, which today is how the U.S. is run, every single product, every single invention, ultimately boils down to the same laws governing its legal status around its, uh, who owns it, we say that there could be multiple verticals of property and contract operating in tandem. So certain things could be, for example, socialized. An easy one is healthcare, right? Where the United States is the only industrialized nation without a universal healthcare program, okay? Every other nation has it. Um, that's an easy one. Uh, we can go even deeper into that, right? So, what we have, uh, ultimately I want to emphasize is that like, private property being the cornerstone of human freedom is a dehumanizing worldview. And what it does, it gives our creations power over us. And as I've argued throughout the course, they don't deserve that power. So, part of this reorientation of how we think about property is to, re to revoke that power. Say, no, these creations can never be enough for us. They have to transform to kind of meet where we are. Um, because ultimately, if we're dogmatic about allowing them to, to control us, then we'll have a permanent underclass. Right? We'll never escape the society of class and caste. Ultimately, when we think about the alternatives, I suggest in the book, and I detail this, is that there's, we can think about property in the way of time-limited or uh, temporary property rights. So the idea being that to encourage experimentalism, to encourage more people to participate in the productive agenda of society, we could classify things um, as public goods, and you could say that, for example, that maybe there's certain restrictions that must be met. So, and this could apply to natural resources, it could apply to technology, it could apply to you know, physical machinery, whatever the case may be. But the idea is you make a use case, you present a use case, and you say, okay, I need it for X amount of time, I wanna, you know, with this resources, I'm going to then accomplish X, Y, and Z. And then it would be great. So, okay, for, for four months, you can have access to the mine, you need to get these materials, and you're gonna transform these materials into Y. At the end of that cycle, then they could either put in another proposal, right? It could go on to the next person if there's a better idea. But again, we, it's, it's more about opening up our collective abundance to more people. The problem with today, as I briefly spoke about in the last class, is not that there is an abundance, there's immense abundance in the world, but it's trapped. It's trapped within organizations and institutions where only kind of a select few get access to it. When we think of a world with AI proliferate, right, with these self-learning machines, we think of a world where we want to, again, encourage the, as many people as possible to experiment with the most advanced forms of production, the most advanced forms of technology, the most advanced knowledge. We want to open up access. So temporary and time-bound resource rights solves that problem. Um, another thing that we have to think about when we think about property is does an extractive model make sense for every single good? And I read a book, I read an example uh, in, in the book about latex gloves. If you guys ever worked in a hospital, right, or, or a doctor's office. Latex gloves. Every medical facility on the planet uses latex gloves. We understand that they, they, you know, they're necessary to prevent disease, right, keep us clean. When we have a product that's so universal like a latex glove, where there is zero innovation, Right? There's no innovation, there's no better latex gloves. They serve the purpose they serve, and that's what they're going to be. The question is, why is there an extractive layer? Why do we say that this could be a profit center when they're so universal in their need? Again, it's not about restricting all profit centers, but it's saying that eventually products may reach a lifespan where if they're universal in their need, they shouldn't be a profit center. So in the book, I develop a concept called a corporate module, which is a corporate module is like a set of laws that you could plug into a corporation. So you don't change the entire corporation because we understand that a manufacturer of latex gloves probably makes many other things. And we don't want to say, hey, look, all of your things have to be socialized. We have to say, hey, the latex glove is now going to be a universal product. So we insert it 
And what we do is we give them a specific classification of, of laws surrounding that one product, and then in exchange, they get subsidies for the product. So they're no longer spending their own money to produce it, they're producing it, and the collective is producing it. Um, they're selling it at the, the lowest price point possible, not to, you know, not for um, profit, right? As in the capitalist system, we might reduce the quality of the good to make more profit, but rather it's a global public good. We produce it. And then more importantly, what that does, if you lay that groundwork, then you can coordinate all of the global manufacturers around it. So now it's not a place-based thing, because obviously there's latex gloves place, you know, built here, they're built in China, et cetera, they're built all over the world. But now we coordinate these institutions for a global product. And in doing so, we reduce the costs because we can combine our personal power for the resources. Um, we can aggregate the logistics so it's more effective, right? There's not less overlaps. So we can use AI to do that. Um, so there's, this is just one example of how we have to think about products and property rights in a continuously globalized world. And question ourselves, does it make sense to have a, few, a, a small group of shareholders have the rights to perpetual extraction on a product that is so universal, that has no innovation? Right? Again, innovation being a key component. It's different when you have something like uh, software or hardware where you know, a lot of that capital might be invested in research and development and like the next thing, but there's no next latex glove. A latex glove is a latex glove is a latex glove. It'll always be the same thing so long as we're using it. So now I'm going to move into the eight dignities. The eight dignities represent the spiritual manifestation, or excuse me, the physical manifestation of our spiritual project. So this is when we, when we truly recognize the divinity of the other. And again, we ground that in the fact that we live in one of many sequential universes. The reality of nature is only ever an immediate present. Uh, we are both within the infinity as unique conscious coordinates, but of it, possessing it in an aspect of our imagination. And the question is, how do we empower people to most um, frequently and most uh, you know, desirably align the observable infinity, the universe and the imagination in the moment, and express their, their powers? The eight dignities represents the combination and, and reinforces our redefinition of the self as the individual and their circumstances a single happening. And it allows us to kind of maximize our moments. What the eight dignities do not do, I want to be clear, is they don't guarantee luxury. They don't guarantee success. What they do do is guarantee an equity of opportunity to try, and ultimately, they help to diminish the past influence on our present. They help free us from a trajectory that all of us had no say in choosing, right? All of this was in motion well before any of us were born. So this is a means of kind of freeing ourselves from the influence of the past. The eight dignities, as you can see here, are represented um, as food and water, housing, healthcare, education, information, communication, and transportation. I'm gonna go over each of those um, to some extent. Food and water are the most obvious. As uh, you know, we spoke about earlier, right? we said if, if an individual lacks food, if they lack access to, to drinking water, it's very difficult to individually actualize. Right? If you're stuck in survival mode, that is a big challenge to kind of find your higher self, find your purpose. Today, when we think about agriculture in the United States, there's an increasing trend, you may or may not be aware, small farmers are being decimated. Uh, family farmers are almost, you know, they're, they're quickly on the road to obsolescence. Because what's happening is, we now inhabit a world of what we call scientific precision agriculture. Essentially, you have robotic tractors and plows that with lasers can like dig a hole and plant a seed and cover it up, and there's no human labor. Um, but they're obviously super expensive. The challenge is, is they're in the hands of these monolithic corporations, right? So the question is, does it make sense to have food be extractive good? My argument is no. Raw foodstuffs should be a public good. What is a raw foodstuff? The corn that grows out of earth. What's not a raw foodstuff? The corn, the frozen corn in the bag in the supermarket, right? That, that adds a productive process to it. There's an, a layer of productivity on top. So I'm not saying that that process shouldn't have an extractive layer. I am saying that raw foodstuffs should be a public good and we should socialize foodstuffs as a means to helping us navigate the crisis. The same thing can be said about water. If you're, uh, so right now, there's about two billion people in the, in the world who lack access to clean drinking water, so a quarter of our population. The crisis of extinction is gonna make that number worse. Uh, we're already seeing in the United States, there's aspects, there's towns in the United States that don't have tap water today. Uh, and that's only gonna get worse. 
And what you are going to see, and this has already been said, so the CEO, are you guys probably familiar with Nestle Corporation, right? Nestle's Crunch is a, Nestle's a mega conglomerate. The CEO has been open about water is not a human right. He's open about that because why? They have a huge bottled water production, right? So what they do is we have to say that it is not unacceptable. And I think a large part of like, when I say the word unacceptable, what makes our value of it's unacceptable versus the Nestle CEO's value that is acceptable, how do you address that conflict? This is the root of why I believe that you have to bind spirituality to the systemic projects. You have to justify it in a shared divinity of the other. You have to justify it in a moral project because the alternative is not enough. The alternative is not like it's, otherwise you know, my word versus that person's word is, is not enough. So to that end, if we're serious about kind of transcending the crisis, we can't have a, an institution that allows for the privatization of water as we know the trends are increasing that more and more people do not have access to fresh drinking water. Housing is the same kind of concept, right? Without a house, without a, a secure dwelling, very difficult to individually actualize. The challenge with the United States today is that housing, um, the economic and law surrounding housing, and in much of the propaganda and much of the narrative that we've been sold is that housing is a primary vehicle of family investment security. Right? You buy a house and that's kind of ultimately that will be your retirement, you'll sell your house. The challenge is that housing can either be affordable or an investment. It cannot be both as an asset class. And we see this manifest in real time with the solution to the housing crisis is build more housing. But what's the problem? Most people don't want high rise apartments in their backyard. Right? They, you have a suburban neighborhood, they say, well, I, I want you to build more housing, but just not here. I would call it nimbyism, not in my backyard. <laughs> and the idea behind that is that when you have a, an economic system that prioritizes transactions, your highest form of cooperation, people will choose their personal finances over the well-being of housing another person. They'll say, yes, I understand that single mother of two needs housing, but just don't build it here. Build it over there, you know, but not, not in my site. And I think that, that kind of undermine, that, that kind of supports the, the larger theme of breaking free of these, these institutions requires a, a paradigm shift of what is and is not a dignity for the individual. We have to recognize that human beings cannot be free if they are not housed. Um, also, I want to emphasize the core argument against like the, behind NIMBYism about not building new apartments is they think property values will go down. Right? Again, when you attach property values as like a secure economic thing. In the book, I quote several studies. Um, they found that for the most part, that's not accurate. There was one study that said that they went down over like, I think it was like 2%, but over, two, uh, over a decade. So over a decade, you lost 10 grand on your house worth uh, because you had a high-rise apartment, but 100 new people had homes. So there's, of course, there's trade-offs, right? I think, again, in a hyper-competitive society like we've designed, we diminish the divinity of the other for our own personal benefits, even such small benefits as 10 grand over a 10-year period. Healthcare, again, Pretty self-evident, the United States is, um, we have just such a disparity of, of who can get served and who can get access to healthcare. As you probably know, our hospitals are overrun with people going to the emergency room for small things, a fever, a cold, right? Because they don't have insurance. And you can go to the emergency room, you can get taken care of, versus you can't go to a doctor because they won't see you if you don't have the insurance, or they will charge you up front, where a hospital has to serve you. So part of the, the stress that we have on our medical system is the fact that we don't have, uh, the US is very poor at preventative care, right? What we're very good at is like emergencies. You go to the hospital, you need surgery, we have brilliant doctors, there's no doubt about that. Um, but we're very poor comparative to our European counterparts with preventative care. There's a great study I reference in the book too about private hospitals and public hospitals, because you see that happen often. Nonprofit hospitals will get bought. And what we see now, and there's a study of, it was something like several thousand hospitals, it was a pretty intense study, there is no outcome difference between a private hospital and a, a public hospital in terms of quality of service and quality of care. What you do see happen is when a hospital goes from uh, public to private, they cut out services that don't bring in uh, excess capital. So what they do is they cut out things like palliative care, at-home care, in favor of more surgical options. You see people who go to private hospitals have more frequent return visits than you do when you have non uh, public hospitals. Why? Because that's how they make their money. 
right? So when you think about healthcare as an institution, when you have a profit incentive on something as vital as healthcare, it perverts the system. It perverts the outcomes and incentives of the people participating within the system. Education. Um, education as a right is, is the most, in the book, is the most extensive chapter I write about the dignity. So if education is of interest to you, I, I recommend you check it out. I'm gonna highlight this real briefly. Uh, there's two, two kind of verticals of education we have to address to kind of systemically actualize. The first is youth education. Today, all of us, myself included, were brought up in what we would call an industrial era of education. That is to say that we went to school, both from primary even to university, and it was the teacher teaches, we were supposed to memorize, and then we regurgitate, right? Here's what you said back to you on a test. And then we're, we're kind of sorted and graded and classified based on how well we could remember the things that we were supposed to be tested on. That's a very hierarchical focus of learning. That was ideal for an industrial era because it trained obedience. It trained listening to the, you know, the, the instructions and then following them over and over again. Today, as I, argue, as I argued earlier, we are progressively getting to this world where the nature of work is fundamentally shifting. The most powerful work today is what we call the knowledge economy. It relies on dialogue. It relies on imagination. It relies on high coordination amongst groups. So I make the argument that we need to shift to a matrix learning of education for our youth where the teacher is less an instructor and more of a facilitator. And the students are allowed to pursue what I would call selective depth. So instead of a set lesson plan that everyone must learn, you allow the students to almost explore what they want to explore. And that's how you further their creativity, that's how you further their passions. Uh, so in many ways, the students will be broken out into pods, collectively they kind of research a project, and then what they do is they share it with the class. They talk to the class about what's going on, they talk to the class about uh, what they learn and what they, they imagine from it, and the, the teacher almost facilitates ask questions. And you can imagine primary school classes ending, every class ends with more questions asked than actually answered. Right? This is how you orient education to meet the needs of the moment, because the youth of today, I, get, I have a three and a half year old, she's growing up with the most powerful technology we've ever had in our lives, self-learning machines, AI. I can't imagine what that's gonna do to society in the next 20 years. It's so astronomically impactful. That's you difficult. You better move her away out of Florida then, because she won't get this kind of education in Florida. You are right, and it's something we're considering. Yeah, we, we presently said that this kind of education is, there are things like um, like the, uh, there's like Montessori schools, which where she goes now, like they do kind of do this, but to your point, the public education system here is um, not ideal. Yeah, so I agree with you. Well, the laws are getting worse. Yes, and, and restrictive, and I think, You've seen, especially in Florida, right, the politici politici uh, politicizing me, of, of education, where it's, you know, we're banning books, we're uh, restricting the rights of certain minority groups, right? If you're uh, an LGBT, if you identify as LGBTQ, you, you don't have access to medical care now. I mean, this is a, it is a, a really, uh, I'll tell you, as someone with a young child, we are, my partner and I are absolutely settled. We are not buying in Florida. This is not where we're settling, but we can't, we can't risk raising our daughter in that kind of environment. We just don't know. There's too many unknowns, and there's not enough vision of kind of you know, the, the collective progress that we, we embody. The other component of education is adult education. And I think this is a, a large component as well. I, I don't follow this. You say there's too many unknowns? With Florida? Yes. Yeah, I just think the, 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 the fact that, like, for example, the, the restricting books, I mean, that's just something I don't, I'm of the belief as a parent that I want to expose my child to as much knowledge as possible and help her navigate the world. I'm not here to dictate what she can and cannot read. Um, I'm not here to dictate you know, her, her direction. I just want her to raise a storm. I mean, that's ultimately my goal as a father is whatever you do, just raise a storm. Do the best you can and you know, do it intensely. Um, and in a political climate where Again, I think book banning is like an easy example. Like when you're banning knowledge because it doesn't align with your political values, or more importantly, your spiritual values, right? Because that's the underlying tone here is that there's some immorality about what they're reading. Um, I disagree with that completely, and I reject that that philosophy. So that's why we would not buy here. And I, you know, I'll express to you, speaking candidly, there's many people in our circle as millennials who are of that same boat. Like we can't have. I would never raise my child in an educational culture where you're not allowed to access certain things. And then more importantly, your teachers would get punished for teaching you certain perspectives, right? As we see happening. That's unacceptable. 
in my you know, opinion. See, that hasn't always been true. That's new. Oh, I agree. I agree because absolutely. That's the political system now. Yes, I agree a hundred percent. And it's it's what happens with the. It's almost to, to an extent, right, our crisis of elective misrepresentation in combination with our crisis of uh, information, truth, and trust is when you continuously push the extremes of like how you rile people up for your base, when you continuously you push the extremes of what is, in, is, is a threat, you have to keep going further and further. You have to make it worse and worse, otherwise you lose that steam. So that's part of the struggle. Um, but let me bring it back for a moment to, to education. Education also is vital for adults. I think what we lack today is, like when we think about the nature of reality in the immediate present, as well as where it will be over the next 20 years, more and more disruption. More and more people getting, you know, losing jobs and having no opportunity. So for example, we can see AI taking over lawyers probably in the next five years. High, like high paying white collar jobs that you studied years for, AI can do better. And AI can recall more law than any individual could ever could, right? And they can interpret that law against all the laws um, much faster and quicker. The problem is not disruption. We've always had disruption. That's not a problem. Well, the problem is that we lack the social infrastructure to allow people to redirect their lives. There's no alternative. You can maybe go back to university, but then you've got to pay 50 to 100 grand to do that at a good university. Uh, so my argument I make in the book is that we need to regulate the, the best firms to essentially become the best schools. So let's say you're a, you know, a, a Microsoft or an Amazon. Amazon's a great example. right? Amazon's the logistical you know, king of the world. Amazon should be regulated to teach people the most advanced forms of logistics, process, and practice. They should be forced to do that. So that adults who are interested in logistics, if their job is disrupted, now they can go to school for free, learn from the best, learn the best technologies, the best protocols, the best practices. Right? It benefits Amazon because then they can select the cream of the crop and say, hey, come here. And the rest of the people can go to other organizations and say, no, I, I learned from the best. I have Amazon. So this kind of gives you an example of how we would redirect education in a systemically actualized society. So we expect disruption to keep happening. Again, not a problem, not something we can avoid. The idea is how do we allow people to redirect their lives? Information and communication. Information and communication is what allows us to connect with people. And I think we've seen it time and time again where governments, not our government, not yet, but governments have shut off communication systems in times of unrest. Right? So a large theme of the eight is, I want to be clear with you, is unbinding our rights from the state. That's a core component. This doesn't work if it's the United States based. It doesn't work if it's only in Europe. It works when we develop organizations that are global. And I talked to you earlier about those DAOs, those kind of pod organizations. They transcend the nation state because A, they're all, um, they're all on chain, they're all, they have a computerized ledger of, of trust. But also they're decentralized, you don't need to be in a certain place. So the idea is how do we unbind human rights from the state? Because so long as our rights are bound to a state, they will be at the whims of political actors. Right? And that's the problem. Kind of similar to the point you were just speaking about. Political actors will further their own agendas at the expense of the collective. Um, so communication, that also refers also to the tools necessary, right? I think um, there's a lot of critiques of like people, for example, like uh, there is, I remember when um, under Obama, they have a cell phone program. And there's a lot of critiques of that. Why are you giving away free cell phones? If you want a society of individually actualized people, you have to recognize that if you don't give people access to the most advanced technology and practice, and they can't afford it themselves, they'll be perpetually second-class citizens. If they don't know how to use and, and take advantage of those tools, they're never going to have the capacity to contribute productively in a world where those tools are required. So it also means giving you, making sure that they have those devices in their hand. Transportation is probably the one that seems like the most out of place, but transportation kind of comes twofold. First, transportation is the right to escape. I think that's very vital. We want to provide people a right to escape. We can't control our birth lotteries. We can't control our parents. But we need to make sure that for individuals who are born to circumstances that are not ideal, abusive, manipulative, whatever, that they have a, an opportunity to leave those circumstances without you know, risk of kind of retribution. So transport, transportation becomes a like better public infrastructure, right? But I make an example in the book. Um, in ocean shipping, uh, there are about 33 companies in the world today for ocean transport. Ocean is our most frequent way of moving goods. The problem is many of them are private companies. Some are state-owned, like China owns a few of them. Um, but ocean logistics is this thing that, like, the fact that they're private incentives it repels innovation. So ocean transport is one of the most polluting industries. Right? The fuel they use in some of these carrier, carriers is one of the worst like fuels that you can burn. 
But what we know is, like, let's say, for example, we know that for example, nuclear reactors in like marine technology and like uh, submarines last forever, and they're super environmentally positive. But the companies don't invest in them because there's no profit incentive to do it. Why would they retrofit all their ships? So the problem is when you have private incentives, on again, this is very similar to the latex glove example. Ocean shipping is something we all need. It's how you move goods around the world. Why is it a, a private industry with many individual players seeking to extract as opposed to a collective industry? Because there's no innovation. And we know there's no innovation because they won't innovate because there's no incentive to do it. It's the same thing with like trash, right? And ocean shipping is the biggest pollutant of our oceans. Many of them just dump trash over into the ocean as they're going through. Because there's no incentive not to. Right? There's no restriction not to. It's all about, because ultimately the trash is weight, and that slows down the boat. The boat. Uh, and then I'll, you know, I'll talk about energy, and then I'll kind of wrap it up, because I know we kind of go a little over time, I want to leave space for, for feedback. Um, I'll talk briefly about spirit back here. Energy is something that our needs are growing exponentially for, and it's only ever going to increase, right? We only need more energy. The most advanced AI systems today use a ton of energy. So in many ways, we kind of need an energy breakthrough to kind of continue our trajectory of progress. The challenge today is, not everywhere, but in many places in the US, energy is a private thing. You pay a company, to, you know, who, the electric company, who extracts from you. It's not a public good. My argument is twofold, right? Again, energy is universal, and it's only expanding. Why is there extractive land? It doesn't make sense. The second component is that the present organization of energy, as these small private verticals, reduces the potential that is available to us now. So here's one solution that we can do in the immediate present. We have the technology we can work on, but it won't happen. The sun is the most powerful nuclear reactor we could ever ask for. It produces way more energy than we can use as a planet now and probably for the foreseeable future. If we had a global collaborative around energy, we could begin to work on putting satellites into space that would collect the sunlight and then beam it back down to Earth. This technology exists. This is not like a fantasy, it's not utopian. We could do this today if we had the coordination. The challenge is we lack the coordination, we lack the motivation for this type of technology. But this, that kind of solution, could produce free energy. Right? Free energy is that breakthrough that transforms human society. That breaks class and caste. Because energy is our most you know, vital resource, is what we need the most of. It's also, today, one of the greatest sources of pollution, right? fossil fuels and, and all these things. It's one of the, the main contributors to our crisis of extinction. But because we have it privatized, because we have these mega conglomerates, Exxon, Shell, Mobile, right? and they're trying to extract as much profit as possible, we are putting innovations that, that exist today off the table. We're saying we're not going to do that. We're going to maximize our extractive powers. And again, because they are so vested in our political process, there's no means for transformation within the institutions. Um, so that's part of the crisis there. So all of these, again, represent our spiritual project of buying the values we embody in alignment with the relational universe governed by the single truth to the systems we surround ourselves to most fully elevate the individual, to recognize the self as the, the, the individual in their circumstance within a given totality of the moment. And finally, I'll just talk very briefly. Spirit Dow's a community that's formed around this book. So they actually I published a book about 16 months ago. There's a formal community that's formed around it. We're actually are, we're in the process of incorporating the 501 c 3 And essentially, all of you who've been here, you know, for the course, you are welcome to be a part of it and share space with us if it's of interest. Um, we meet twice a week, and we have three core purposes, which is to spread our message, to build value for our community, and to further the eight dignities. Um, as an organization, kind of where we're at right now, is Spirit Down primarily is focused on building community and building community value. And we do a lot of fundraising where then we support projects. We provide grants to individuals supporting projects in the eight dignities, supporting public goods. So something as simple as like, I want to build a community-owned co-op vertical farm in my town, to I'm trying to develop new logistics software with AI to kind of to streamline the process. These are things that kind of move us closer to these goals. Um, I will let me just see. These are our tech stack, but I want to show you real briefly. This is how we envision. This is our operational structure. So how we, you know, capital flows into our organization, what we invest in, and how it looks. You know, we do a lot of uh, events and outreach. Um, I mentioned the book already. If, if I mentioned in the past, but if you weren't here, I transferred the rights of the book to the community. So all the profits the book has ever made have gone to the community. Um, all the future profits. The community then translated to a graphic novel to appeal to younger demographics, and it's, it's a bit easier to digest than a 500 page book. Uh, so this is just a bit about how, what we look like and what we do. So on that note, that concludes our conversation on systemic actualization. Deeply appreciate you all being here. I know this is a lot, but I want to open up the space. Questions, comments, critiques, you can kind of go. Yes, Brian. Uh, 
I think you've described a beautiful dream. And I think nice little groups was getting together and discussing things and once in a while getting a bread. It's nice. I'm looking at the political scene today and I do not see one one way to go even one step step toward any of this. Yes. I and look at Florida as the absolute worst of all. There's no state in the in the country that's worse than Florida right now. I think I think I think technically Missouri is like the fifth down, like they're like the bottom of all that. I'm sure Florida's <laughs> down there. But the one thing I'll share with you is I agree hundred percent of what you just said is that the present institutions provide us no alternative. I agree. And I want to emphasize that is why I believe organizing this project in a religious context, incorporating it as a religion, is the ideal framework to kind of transcend the institutions. Because I agree with you, you cannot do this to the institutions because they're self-preserving. Right? They want to the status quo is their ideal because it's about power maintenance. So how do we go outside them? I don't know. This may or may not be the right ideal, and I agree with you. It is, it is an immense goal. And it's something that like, I undertake full well knowing that I may do this for the next 20 years and accomplish nothing. And that's okay. right? It's, it's worth trying. It's worth kind of spreading the message of getting it out there to people. Um, but, that's why, but I believe in the United States, at least, the, religion, the, the 501c3 religious corporation is the ideal like, tax framework, if you will, to maximize the amount of capital you could allocate to, to align projects which is kind of how we're, we're moving towards. Um, but to your, your point, the whole reason I believe that it's got to be in the context of a spiritual con you know, uh, an orientation, if you will, is all of the meaning and value frameworks we've inherited proliferate what is. They just ser serve to support what is. They're deeply entrenched in the hierarchy. So I think it has to begin with a reorientation of self to, to kind of orient towards the possible. But ultimately, it's an individual choice. right? Ultimately, it's like, I hear you say that, uh, and I'm not going to put you on the spot, but let's say to any other individual, I would say, well, what are, what are you going to do? Right? If that's the, if that's the case, if the case is that I'm, I feel hopeless given the, the circumstance, well, then how are you going to act towards the alternative? This is one framework of an alternative, right? But our community is going in many different directions. You know, that's the beauty of this. Is I've, I've given this away. I've made sure that it has as little to do with me as possible because it's supposed to be a collective effort. Um, and, and I told my community already, in, in like a decade, my plan is to, to leave the organization, to kind of cut the head off the snake, if you will. Um, because I have a lot of soft power. I have no more hard power than anyone else, but I have a lot of soft power, and I want to kind of diminish that. So thank you for your feedback. Appreciate you making it. <laughs> yeah, you, you. I mean, I, I see this as a global socialism. You're very much a socialist. And that's not a negative statement. I, I have no problem with socialism. I've, I, I mean, the healthcare was a great example for me because I've lived in Canada, I've lived in Israel, I've lived in Europe you know, during my lifetime. Um, the eight dignities I see as basic human rights. Mm -hmm. I have a problem with the way we use spirituality and divinity. Mm -hmm. Although oh, I, I do agree that it's that everyone represents or has that in them. Now, obviously, for me, my self-actualization comes through Judaism. Sure. And, and, and I'm, I'm a liberal Jew. I'm a very liberal. And, and one of the definitions of liberal Judaism is change. Mm -hmm. so, and change in, in concert with what's going on with society. So that, that uh, uh, um, helps one area. I was making a lot of notes, as you probably saw. And let, me, let me just get to, the, to where I, I actually wrote down. So uh, first of all, and we don't have to go into this argument again. I don't agree with you in terms of the severity of the crisis. Okay. Um, and again, uh, my, uh, my feeling is that AI will be replaced by something else in the future. I probably won't live to see that. But I mean, for many of us sitting here with the atom bomb and the scare with the atom bomb, we thought it was going to be the crisis. Mm -hmm. You know, OK. Um, so, uh, and again, I said my core values are based on Judaism and change and that, that grit you gave me 
is very different from yours, but it, 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 you know, I did that last yeah. week, and it was a, a good exercise for me. Um, it, your socialist approach to democracy, I don't think you can replace some sort of religion, or you've tried to replace religion with, with uh, something more secular, and ultimately God has to come into the picture for me. Mm -hmm. And I understand that you know, your generations disagree with that, but I think the way you define self-actualization, it applies, if I've got it right, to society, to a, a societal structure, which is a socialist structure, and the idealistic, and uh, 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 but it, it it limits for me self actualization because it leaves that uh, uh, one part out. It applies to your role in society, and and I understand it it, it attempts to uh, replace, get rid of class structure. Again, socialism, you know, and I'm not using that in any pejorative way because I think that we should be more socialist. With our generation, and I can probably speak for people in this room, the majority of our, uh, our generation are going to reject yeah. as socialism, as you know, my, young, my younger nephews and, 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 uh, and these are much more open open to it. It's of course the environment that we grew up in. So, I mean, that's a little bit of the feedback. And and if you tell keep my interest in oh, uh, obviously, but I read lots of books. Um, but you know, uh, but 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 um, you know, I I I can't. I'm not not with you really. You know. Can I ask you some clarifying questions? So um, the first is I appreciate all your critiques, and I don't deny any of them. Well, wanna, not all critiques. No, yeah, it's your it. feedback. Um, I want to emphasize that you're absolutely right that there's a huge socialist component to this, but I want to emphasize that despite that, it's not. it wouldn't eliminate private markets, right? So for right. example, like the 1880s would be socialized, but if I wanted to make a game, a video game, that could be easily a private market. If I wanted to make a fancy shirt, that could be a private market, right? So I want to emphasize that it's... Um, I think the challenge when we use the language of socialism is people assume the wholesale substitution. No, I'm not assuming yeah. from the, at least the way I understand from, from it. Your, so I, I am curious, because so you said one thing that stuck out to me, and it seemed like you, you said you didn't agree, but when you shared it, it seemed to me like you were saying the same thing. So you recognize through Judaism the divinity inherent in the other. You recognize that change is, is the universal constant, it's the, I call it the single truth, right? The argument that that's the one defining aspect of our realities in, in a variety of directions, right? How do you, in recognition of the divinity of the other, how can we say, or how can we approach the system surrounding us, if not with like a fervency? If how can we say that, yes, the other is divine, and yes, we recognize that infinity latent in their, in their powers, but if we're unwilling to, to bind it to a, a systemic project, because in, a, in an infinitely material universe, again, I would argue that you, the self is indistinguishable from the circumstances you find yourself in within a moment, how, does, how can we most fully embody that belief of divinity in the other without acting upon it in, in the creations that we surround ourselves with. That, I guess, is the kind of core question. And frankly, one of the reasons I, I wrote the text is because I feel like most of the narratives today don't address that problem. Yeah, and I, see, and I, I, I think that, at least from my standpoint, Judaism will embrace working with the system around. I mean, it says that you should work with the, the system you're in to improve the system. <laughs> It's very, it, it, it is more here and now oriented than Christianity, for instance. Sure. Ju, ju, you know, the Jewish outlook is that you are involved in life here sure, and yeah. now, and that not everything is looking to overcome, there's no original sin. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm going to get theological, but that, yeah, please do. that's my, yeah, you know, that's my, see, I'm a rabbi, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sorry if I'm dominating this, but, um, you know, so I, I, I have no, I, I, you know, I don't, 
I, 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 I certainly agree that, that each of us has a, a divinity and each of us has to improve the world. There's this a way. No. whole concept of fixing the world within uh, 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 the theology that I believe in. And, and I'm quite comfortable or self-actualized, to use your words, Yes, uh, not, not completely self-actualized in the sec what I call the secular system or the democracy, the capitalist system that I live, live in, but, but in terms of other kinds of things, I, would, I find that, uh, that you have reduced spirituality or divinity to something that really I wouldn't define as spirituality or divinity exactly. Uh, and so the self-actualization that I see you talking about is a bit different uh, definition than what the, uh, I, I think I have a broader definition, or for me, I yeah, you know, yeah, and I'm not, you know, and it's, pers it's personal, I mean, you it know. Always, it always is, right? But, so I, my question then is, um, so, uh, if you guys have to run, don't let me hold you. Obviously, I'm just, no, I'm just, I'm just yeah. So, I, the clarifying point I want to recognize is like, we define divinity in the text in the, the reoriented, reoriented Spiritual Project as the alignment of the observable infinities, right? The imagination of the universe itself, because this is what our observations tell us. So, to your point, there is an era of spec, you, you mentioned before, and I'll, I'll comment, there is an, a, 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 an aspect of secularism to this belief, because it's really based on our observations. But when you mention God, that you know, I mentioned, I think, in the first or second course, the question to that is, well, what could be more God-like than infinity? What is, if, if infinity is the nature of reality as we experience it, what, what is God beyond omnipresent, omnidirectional? Yeah, you know? yeah I mean, we, we live in God with all of those uh, pronouns. Yeah, of course, right? Neti, neti. Right? Pronouns for God, yeah, yeah, yeah. names. God. It, 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 so we can never describe it, but at least the argument I would make is that you, the infinite nature of the reality gives it a context that you know, aligns, if we are in fact made of the image of God, right? If we, and Which God, is a Jewish concept. Of course, right? And, and if we are in fact in that, that context, then it seems natural that to recognize, and I know, you know to your point, as you mentioned, you embody that, you're a part of that, right? You're made in that image, you, you inherit that. So that is the core kind of spiritual component. The systemic component is more about the recognition of the divinity. So. I hear what you're saying about like I'm, I'm. Well, I would disagree respectfully that it's reductionism. It's more of like an extension of because if we're genuine about recognizing the divinity of the other, and our core values, for example, of relation, I recognize that that's like a core value I embody. Then I it creates a restlessness in me because so many of us are trapped. They don't have the capacity to align the observable with infinities. Um, so appreciate those, those that feedback. Appreciate that commentary. And, and I'm going to send you guys, I know I said it last week, but I, I, I didn't do it, but I'm going to definitely do it today. I'll send you a final email of all the courses, all the videos, all the chapters. And if, you, if it's ever of interest, um, I'm happy to keep the conversation going. If you guys know any other opportunities of people who'd like to hear me you know, chat, I have much shorter than four-hour ones, right? I, can do, I have an hour, I have a half an hour. Um, but obviously, I'm just trying to kind of spread the message and get feedback around it and kind of orient ourselves. So deeply appreciate you guys. Thank you so much. I appreciate much. your comments. Your comments and thoughts and my comments and thoughts are what the governor calls woke. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's what he's I can't get my head around and woke. That's, but and that's, that's, that's it. it. You yeah. and I have illustrated that. <laughs> yeah. And if and that's what he's trying to eliminate in the state of Florida, and he's making a pretty good yeah, it's it's gonna be rough. And by the way, the guy who just left used to be the superintendent of schools in Hillsborough County. Oh, did he? Yeah. And he and there's a school named after him. Oh, really? Walter Sickle. Oh, how fun! Walter Sickle. Sickle. And that was Sickle. And that was the man. That's the man who the, the school is uh, named for. I've heard for. that. The school. Now I know the man. I wish he would have done. He he has Alzheimer's now, so uh, he's not. Yeah, yeah. It's tough. But but he he is. A wonderful man. He has a wonderful history. So thank you for coming. I just, I don't, you have not reassured me a bit about the government, though. Well, yeah, <laughs> I, share, but I share your disdain. That's the problem. I don't think there is I a, mean, you know. I mean, you were talking about health care. Yeah. Florida did not expand Medicare 
which means that 800,000 more people yes. are without care than, than were before. Yeah, I mean, uh, uh, health care, uh, when it comes to socialism, I happen to believe that socialism but, or... But both ways, it's wrong, what's going on. Yeah, no, I, I, I have friends when, uh, in, in Britain, they're not 100% happy with what the system they have, but I can tell you when this woman's mother got sick, the, 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 the surgeries were covered. I mean, people go bankrupt here to put somebody into nursing. Her, that was all taken care of. She lost a job at one point. Um, nothing, no problem. Uh, I, I was also thinking, although this isn't so socialized, but portable pensions, people have lost their pensions here. Mm -hmm. in, 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 and of course, Social Security was meant to fix some of that during the Depression, but who can live up and really live up and sustain what themselves? Is, what is your background? Are you a teacher? I'm a rabbi. Oh, okay. I mean, I've got a, 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 a doctor of doctor degree, so I have taught. I've taught well, a few of have a doctor But Is that a Huh? You said in Scientology? Psych yeah, counseling. Psychology. Psychology. Not psychology. 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 used to teach the self-actualization. Yeah. yeah. Fascinating. So, anyway. But it, it, it was interesting because I was with a, a group of men last night yeah. that are all in the IT area, you know, and they're talking about all these they're talking about, 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 about you know, uh, uh, jargon. I was completely dumbfounded, quiet, because I didn't understand the thing they were saying. Yeah. And so finally, one of them that doesn't really know me, the others know me and know what I do. You're very quiet. I said, well, yeah, because I'm in an area, you know, that it just... I don't know the jargon, and you're all, you're talking about, about math and and you know all of these systems that you know are beyond beyond me. I'm glad to be able to do the, yeah. what I well, do on the. Thank computer. you. Well, my pleasure. Thank you. I'm going to let you do something in there. <laughs> <laughs>